So good evening, everyone. Welcome again to the Jesuit Institute here in Johannesburg, South Africa. My name is Father David Neuhaus, a Jesuit working in the Institute, and we have come together for a session in Advent entitled, A Child Has Been Born for Us, Reading the Infancy Narratives. Let us once again start with a moment of prayer accompanied with the Teze music, Wait for the Lord. So good evening once again, friends. I'm very happy to be with you studying these figures in the texts of Christmas as we prepare for Christmas during this Advent season. Last week, we looked closely at the figure of Joseph 
and tonight we want to look closely at the figure of Mary. I've given the title Mary the Prophetess. I hope that that title will be crystal clear by the time we come to the end of our session today. Remember, I will speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes for questions finishing before load shedding begins at eight o'clock. So let's dive into the figure of Mary, and we'll be looking predominantly at the Gospel of Luke. It is Luke who really gives us the Mary we know from the New Testament. But there is a text written before the Gospel of Luke that mentions Mary, but very much in line with the canonic presentation of Jesus. You'll remember kenosis is that emptying, that emptying of every power, every divinity. And Mary in the Gospel of Mark is mentioned by name only once in chapter 6 when Jesus comes to Nazareth and after being astounded by his wisdom and his teaching, the people then turn and they say, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Notice here, being called the son of Mary is no compliment. One does not call a man in the society of Jesus' time by the name of his mother. The son of Mary is really an insult. And we don't know much else about Mary, but she is indeed the mother of Jesus. Afterwards, Matthew will take up Mary into his gospel, but he will make Mary very secondary to Joseph. As we discovered last week, the focus in the Gospel of Matthew is really on Joseph, and Mary is a secondary character. But we want to focus on Mary tonight. So we're diving into the Gospel of Luke. And let's remember, the Lucan Gospel is very structured. In those first two chapters that we call the Infancy Gospel, we have two annunciations right at the beginning, the annunciation to Zechariah, the annunciation of the birth of John, and that is followed by the annunciation to Mary. We'll speak a little bit more about that annunciation a little later. Then at the very center is the meeting of the two pregnant women, Mary and Elizabeth both of them carrying in their womb the children who meet for the first time before they are born, and John dances in Elizabeth's womb, telling his mother that the one who is coming in Mary's womb is her Lord. And then the Lucan uh, two chapters continue with two fulfillments of the Annunciations. Firstly, the birth of John, and then the birth of Jesus. And to fill out the whole structure, we have two more narratives in those first two chapters, Jesus at the age of 40 days and Jesus at the age of 12 years, his first two entries into the temple in Jerusalem. Interestingly, and I point this out, you can look at it more closely and maybe one day we'll have the time to study this in more depth, but what Luke writes in chapters 1 and 2 is paralleled in the Acts of the Apostles. For just as here we are focusing in on the formation of the body of Jesus, in chapter 1 of Acts of the Apostles, we have the formation of the body that will represent Jesus in the world after Jesus has ascended into heaven, a body for God's presence in the world. Now, let's look at what Luke writes about Mary. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. 
This is the presentation of Mary again, coming immediately after the Annunciation to Zechariah. And of course, we are well aware that Luke wants us to compare this elderly, learned man working in the temple in Jerusalem, who has difficulty believing what the angel is telling him as he goes in for the offering of the incense. And compared to this young, simple woman, not in the center in Jerusalem, but in a God-forsaken place that no one ever heard of in Nazareth, this young woman, a virgin, engaged. Now, I want to look a little bit more closely at that idea of virgin, which sometimes presents a bit of a stumbling block, but I think we should realize this is a vocabulary that evokes something very important in the Old Testament. In fact, the whole idea of virgin refers to the people of Israel, and Mary is indeed a representative, perhaps for us as Christians, the best representative of an Israel listening closely to the word of God and obeying. Let us look at some texts that use the word virgin to speak of the people of God. A text from Isaiah chapter 37, then Isaiah son of Amoz sent to Hezekiah saying, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, because you have prayed to me concerning King Sennacherib of Assyria. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. She despises you. She scorns you, virgin daughter Zion. She tosses her head behind your back, daughter Jerusalem. Or two quotes from the book of Jeremiah. Therefore, thus says the Lord, ask among the nations, who has heard the like of this? The virgin Israel has done a most horrible thing. Or again in chapter 31, again, I will build you and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall take your tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Please remember that. Take up your tambourines and go forth in dance. We'll come back to the dance. Or in the book of Lamentations, what can I say for you? To what, com to what compare you, O daughter Jerusalem? To what can I liken you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter Zion? For vast as the sea is your ruin, who can heal you? So let us notice that this word virgin, Luke uses it to describe Mary, is an important word in the Old Testament used to describe the people of God, of course, the bride of God. But we might have thought immediately of a very different text, a text that would be part of the gospel we focused on last week. It's the connection between virgin and the Emmanuel. But here we have a bit of a problem because in Hebrew, the text reads, and I won't read it in Hebrew, but in the English translation, look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. That is the Hebrew version that we would have in our English Bibles or whatever Bibles we are reading in whichever language, because we translate the Old Testament from Hebrew. But the ancient translation of the Hebrew into Greek adopted the word virgin. Not such a surprise if we remember the text we just read where the word virgin is used. And there it is written in Greek, look, not the young woman, but the virgin is with child and shall bear a son and you shall name him Emmanuel. Of course, we all understand what is the difference between a young woman and a virgin, but many young women are virgins. And so there is no mistranslation here but really perhaps the Greek translator is influenced by the rest of prophetic literature. Of course, very important is the taking up of that verse in Isaiah into the Gospel of Matthew. And there we can read, all this took place to fulfill 
what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, and what has been fulfilled is that Mary is with child before she lives with Joseph. And the citation is then given, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear its son, and they shall name him Immanuel, which means God is with us. Again, I believe that Luke is writing after Mark and after Matthew, and his insistence that Mary is a virgin engaged will have all of this in the background. But what is very interesting is that in the book of Isaiah, we have near the beginning of the book in chapters seven and eight, the mentioning of three children who are born. There is a first child mentioned in Isaiah chapter seven, verse three. His name is Sha'ar Yashuv. He is a son of Isaiah accompanying Isaiah on the way. In Hebrew, the name means a remnant will return. And then a little later in chapter seven, we have the Immanuel. We're not quite sure who that young woman is who will give birth to a child called Immanuel. Is it the, the queen? Is it Isaiah's own wife? Or is it, as I think it might be, a woman passing in the street? pregnant in that terrible time of crisis, herself showing the opening of a horizon just by her readiness to bear a child into the world. But in chapter 8, there is a third child mentioned, and it is written there, Isaiah speaking, and I went to the prophetess. Notice the use of the word prophetess. She is Isaiah's wife. And she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Name him Maher, Shalal, Hashbaz. For before the child knows how to call my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away by the king of Assyria. You might ask, what does that mean, Maher, Shalal, Hashbaz? They are words that resonate with war, quick, take booty, enter, and ruin. The three children are symbols of the life of Israel. Sha'ar Yashuv, a remnant, will return after the terrible destruction represented by the name Maher Shalal Chashvaz. But through it all, Immanuel, God is with us. These three names are symbolic, and the prophetess is a prophetess, for she bears that word in her womb. At least two of these children are the fruit of the prophetess's womb, Shar Yashuv and Maher Shalal Chashbaz. Perhaps she is also the young woman, or in Greek, the virgin, that is giving birth to Immanuel. Now, another very important aspect of this text is the name Mary. Once again, we are confronted by a problem. We read the Bible in Greek, rather the New Testament in Greek, and so we call her Mary, for her name in Greek is Mariam. But there is a predecessor of Mary, also called Mary, but we call her by her Hebrew name, Miriam. And please notice, here we are with the dance. I read from Exodus 15, the people have crossed the sea, that great crossing, which is the birth of the people. And this people of slaves bent over, come across the sea, and Miriam is there as a midwife, as a mother of Israel, this is what's written after the great song of Moses. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and with dancing. Remember those words from Jeremiah. And here we have the root here in this experience of crossing the sea, fleeing from the Egyptians in fear, bent over still as slaves, 
but Miriam on the other side of the sea teaches them to stand with their heads held high. She teaches them how to dance and you cannot dance when you are bent over and in fear. I want to share with you a clip of one of my favorite films of all time. You might be surprised to know that the film is The Prince of Egypt. There are many things in this movie that are presented with great biblical depth. And one of them is exactly this moment of Miriam taking the tambourine and dancing so that the people learn to walk erect. Let's watch. your people, Moses. They are free. moment of birth, the people has passed through the blood on the doorposts, 
of their homes as they leave the womb of Egypt, and the water, the raging water, they have come through the other side, safe. This is a birth experience, and Miriam plays a very central role. You noticed her playing the tambourine, and the people walking upright, and Sipporah, the wife of Moses, saying to him, look at your people, they are free. At the center of the Pentateuch, we have a wonderful description of this people, a free people. It is the end of the blessings that come at the end of the book of Leviticus in chapter 26. And this verse is a very important verse for Luke in his writing of the Jesus story. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be their slaves no more. I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect, made you walk with your heads held high. The word in Hebrew, komemiyut, is to really walk with your back straight and your head held high, the exact opposite of how you walk when you're a slave, bent over. Again, the role of Mary, the first Mary, the Miriam or Mariam in Greek of the Old Testament, is her taking up the tambourines so that they will learn to walk erect with their heads held high. She is there at that moment of birthing. I hope this reminds you of a story in the Gospel of Luke. Only there do we find the story. In Luke 13, Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. In those chapters, there are very few miracles. The miracles are all concentrated when Jesus is on his mission in Galilee. As he walks to Jerusalem from chapter 9 to chapter 19, most of his teaching involves parables. But there are a few miracles, and one of them is very significant, connected to our theme. Let's read. Jesus is in the synagogue, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. And then the text continues when Jesus has to face criticism for doing this miracle on a Sabbath. And he answers those who are protesting. And he says, and ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? Notice the description, the description of a slave being set free. Luke does not use the word here that we have in Leviticus 26, walking erect with one's head held high. And I've put there the word in Greek because remember, Luke would have read the scriptures, would have known the scriptures in Greek. And what is written in Leviticus is metaparesias. Again, the image is clear in this woman. She stands up straight and is then able to praise God. And I see her dancing, dancing in the synagogue and dancing as she goes home. For the first time in 18 years, she can celebrate the Sabbath, the day of freedom. Now, this expression, metaparesias, Luke reserves for use in the Acts of the Apostles. It is again in the Acts of the Apostles that we will find Mary there, right in the center of the community. Jesus has ascended into heaven, and they gather after 
having seen him off on the ascension, they gather, and Mary is right there. Now, in the description of the new body, the body that will now be the body that makes God present in the world, Jesus' body is in heaven. But Jesus' body in the world, us, the church, will be filled with the Spirit so that this body, this church, can walk erect. And again, I think it's very significant that Luke puts Mary right at the center of the church. This expression, meta parecias, is used numerous times in the Acts of the Apostles, and I would like to focus on two usages when it is used twice in the Acts of the Apostles. First, let's look at the icon. Ah, this icon is a very well-known Maronite icon coming from the Maronite church with its center in Lebanon. Notice it is Pentecost written there, both in Greek and in Syriac. And Mary right there in the center, the spirit coming down to fill the body, the body that now represents the body that is at the right hand of God, Jesus' own body. And filled with that spirit, they too can have their heads held high. Remember, they are still in fear. Fear of a world that put their master to death. Fear of a world that will persecute them. That will not make place for the gospel, the good news that they must announce. But being filled with the Spirit like Mary, they can have their head held high. It is often translated with different words, as we'll see, but it's exactly the same expression that we had in the book of Leviticus, that description of an Israel, an Israel that has emerged from slavery. The bars of slavery have been broken and Israel walks with its head held high, praising God, free. So I've chosen just two uh, different texts, the actually the first and the last in the book of the Acts of the Apostles that makes use of this concept of walking with one's head held high. The first time it's used is in chapter two. The body has just been filled with the spirit. People are amazed. It's the day of Pentecost, the day of the first fruits. And they have come on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And you'll remember the scene where they are gathered outside a room where the spirit fills the disciples. And they start to speak and are understood by this very, very diverse group of Jewish pilgrims coming from all over the world, the world at that time where Jews were spread, they have come to Jerusalem on this pilgrimage feast. And Peter will stand up and try to explain to them what's going on. And at a certain point, he will say, fellow Israelites, I may say to you, and our Bible says, confidently. Indeed, that's the fruit of what the word means in Greek. I may say to you, with head held high, I am not bent over, I am not afraid. I have been filled with the Spirit. I am here to proclaim the gospel. I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Again, I bring the word here, parisia, appearing for the first time in the Acts of the Apostles, reserved by Luke for the Acts of the Apostles to describe the body that is pregnant with Jesus and ready to give Jesus to the world. This will be the vocation of the body. It is no surprise that Mary 
is in fact not only the mother of Jesus, but the mother of the church and a symbol of the church. For we too are filled like she is with Jesus and offer him to the world. That begins in chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. The body is born, coming out of the slavery of fear, anxiety, closing in on itself. It now opens up to share the name, the name of Jesus, with a world that we believe is waiting. Now, I skip over all the other uses of the verbal form and the noun with our heads held high. And I go right to the end, the last verses of the Acts of the Apostles. And those of you who know the book will remember that we have moved from a mission of Peter to a mission of Paul. And at the end of the Acts of the Apostles, Paul has arrived in Rome. And this is what it says right at the end. We are often a little surprised. Why does it end as though this is not the ending? There is no end of the story. For the last verses say this. He lived there in Rome two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, the same word, with his head held high. Yes, the yoke of slavery has been broken. He has been filled with the spirit. He carries Jesus and seeks to offer Jesus to a world that is hungry for the presence of God. And he does it metaparesias. Again, that expression repeats itself and without hindrance showing that God is working. Again, that might now make more sense why Luke chooses to end the story here. This is our story, an ongoing story. Luke could not write the ending because he did not see the end. We cannot write the end, for we have not seen the end. In this Advent time, Mary is a model for us. For indeed, she has made place for Jesus at the very center of her life. And let's remember that was no simple task as this virgin engaged. But she is there as a symbol of the church to show us what it means to be filled with Jesus, filled with the Spirit, and metaparesias, with her head held high as the church is explicitly described, to offer Jesus to a world that is waiting. We, in fact, have not finished with Mary the prophetess. We will come back to Mary the prophetess again in the Gospel of Luke in two weeks' time. But this is probably enough for tonight before we take a time of questions. So let's end with a moment of prayer. Let us pray as we prepare in this Advent time to receive the child, that we all, men and women, might be mothers of God, mothers of the child who is the word of God. Like Mary, may we make place for the child in our midst, nurture it, and with heads held high, offer it to a world thirsting for God's presence. Pray for us, Holy Mary, Mother of God. And so, friends, as I hope I mentioned, and perhaps I didn't, um, questions can be put into the dialogue box, the little uh, box at the bottom, and Ursula will help us to process those questions and comments.
And seeing as Thank there you, aren't any yet, I think that <laughs> Ursula will have a number of questions of her own. I do, in fact. Um, I was very intrigued by the image of um, the birth of, yeah, well, the image you use of a baby being born, blood and water, but also um, that a baby is all curled up in its mother's womb, and as it's born, it stands up erect. And I just, uh, I, yeah, it's intrigued me that that all of that is is in what you said. So thank you. That was very nice. Well, I like I like that image, huh? because, and here I might get it wrong, seeing as I was not an observer of my own birth, and I don't have any of my own children, but I do have this idea that when the baby comes out, there is a midwife there and she takes the baby and gives him a sound slap on the bottom. That would <laughs> make stand direct. I think really that's Miriam, okay? Miriam dancing with the tambourine, okay? I think that we must retrieve that image of Miriam as a prophetess and her prophecy is not words. The words are Moses's words. Her prophecy is the dance. And I really think we need Miriam's prophecy in our lives now so that we know how to stand erect, dance, and sing the praises of God. Again, I think these two Miriams are intimately linked in that sign for our times. Hmm. Um, Keith says, I'm not sure I got the connection between Mary the prophetess and the freed slave with the head held high. So again, I hope that in what I just said to Ursula, it might be a little clear, but let me repeat it again, because I think it is something very central. And that is Miriam, the prophetess, is the one who is the midwife of the birth of a people that is emerging from the womb of slavery. Ursula has made it even more connected with the baby all curled up like a slave in the womb. And the emergence of the baby into the light is accompanied by that prophecy of Mary, Miriam, the sister of Aaron and Moses, who dances with the tambourine, leading the whole people. And this is what I so love in that clip of the Prince of Egypt. The whole people bursts into dance, singing, Ashira, Ashira, it's in Hebrew, let me, let, let, uh, let, let me sing. Ah, let me sing a song of glory and thanksgiving. So I hope, Keith, that makes it a little clearer. Um, Father Francis says, Father David, do you have a few words to say about the Magnificat as it appears to fit in with the context of being set free, head held high, and breaking in song filled with the Holy Spirit? So, Father Francis, I don't have a few words. I have many, many words, but we don't have a lot of time. So <laughs> let's just look at that because we sing it. Ah, we sing it every day. We sing it every day in evening prayer. That Magnificat is really, again, the sign that Mary and Mary are so connected. Because remember that Mary is singing a song with her head held high that talks about the overturning of the earthly order, the overturning of the earthly order, which parallels exactly the exodus from slavery, okay? So that the hungry will be filled and the filled will go hungry, that absolute revolutionary overturning makes Mary again this prophetic figure that is seeing a world that is liberated from the slavery of Pharaoh. And our pharaohs are many and diverse, but our Lord and King is one, and he's the one who's come to set us free. Mary, again, is singing that song. Okay, it's interesting. I didn't stress it because we only read just a few verses, but right through the two chapters, we see a lot of prophetic figures. John, Zechariah, but right at the center, that meeting between these two prophetic women who are carrying prophecy in their wombs, Mary and Elizabeth, is absolutely central to the whole structure of Luke 1 and 2. Uh, the visitation, 
is again a theme that we need to go back to and see it as a key to what happens before and what happens afterwards. I don't know if there's any more questions in the coming. Anybody got a burning? Okay. Love the connection between the healing of the woman bent over for 18 years. Um, Again, I think that's a very interesting story, only because it's not one story of a miracle healing in a series of miracle healings. There is there something that is almost a parable to reflect on because it comes in that series of parables. Again, Jesus is on the way to Jerusalem. What is he doing on the way to Jerusalem? He is trying to teach his disciples how to be disciple. The Galilee mission was connected to who he is and that is answered. We now know who he is, particularly with the event of the transfiguration. And then he turns his face to go to Jerusalem. It is when he turns his face to go to Jerusalem that we enter into this long journey. And the journey is really the journey of learning to be disciple. This bent over woman is again a very powerful image of being a disciple coming in search of Jesus so that she can stand erect and enter into the fullness of our vocation. And I would say that our vocation is Sabbath. What is Sabbath? It's the peak experience of being in the image and likeness of God. It's being able to give thanks for that, to praise, to dance uh, in that being children of God. So again, I love that story, and I think that that story is much more important than simply another miracle story telling us who Jesus is, because we already know who Jesus is. That ended uh, at, towards the end of chapter 9. I think in some ways you've answered Sir Hale's question, which is, how do we be humble with our head held high at the same time? Sir Hale has always very difficult questions. I think that this is an enormous challenge. Again, I think it's very, very important to realize that Luke has done something that none of the other evangelists have done. He's added a whole book to the book of the gospel. He's written 28 chapters so that we can really follow through and understand how we live out our discipleship. And, of course, it's not a fairy tale. It's not a myth. It's the real story of who we are as we fall over and over again. Until the end of chapter 4 in the Acts of the Apostles, things are just great. We really are in the image and likeness of Jesus. But from chapter 5 onwards, the problems begin. And among the problems, of course, is the problem that Suhel mentions, and that is our need to know that we must be humble. That walking with our head held high is because we are filled with Jesus, not filled with ourselves. When we fill ourselves with ourselves, we fall flat on our faces. So I think that this again is very much part of what Luke is teaching us and offering us the example of Mary uh, as a model for how to walk with our heads held high knowing that everything we do, everything we are, is from somewhere else, not from us, but from God. Um, Sean Collins uh, asks, what is the meaning of Elizabeth? Okay, well, first of all, Sean Collins, I see you there. I don't see everyone, but I do see Sean Collins on the screen because he's <laughs> there on the bottom row. My first question to you would be, who is Elizabeth in the Old Testament? Okay, and I'm sure that I'm not trying to embarrass Sean Collins. I think if I opened it up to all of us, we might not remember that there is a first Elizabeth. Okay, again, we're speaking Greek, Elizabeth. If we spoke Hebrew, we would say Elisheva. And Elisheva is 
the wife of Aaron. The wife of Aaron, Moses' brother. Isn't that interesting? Again, the names are not simply coincidental. The names are to arouse a whole rootedness in the Old Testament that by retrieving it, we understand these figures in a lot more depth than we would if we simply read Luke's story. Luke's story is written with these inbuilt echoes. Okay, now I haven't answered what the word means, what the name means, but we would have to go back to the Hebrew. Okay, and it probably has something to do with the fidelity of God, ah, God's oath, God's fidelity. Again, remember Elizabeth, waiting so long, a Sarah type of figure, waiting and waiting and waiting, and never despairing, and finally receiving what God has promised. So I hope, hopefully that's helpful. And you can go back to, I think it might be in Exodus 7, Exodus 6 or 7, to find the first Elizabeth, who we don't know much about, but the very fact that she is the wife of the first priest and the second Elizabeth is the wife of Zechariah, the priest. Um, that's awesome. Thank you. I just Googled it. Uh, Elizabeth means God's promise or God is my oath in, in what Google says. And so, is that different uh, from what I said, Ursula? No, it's the same. But <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for doing that. Next time I know that you're on the Google, I can say, oh, I don't know, but Ursula will know. <laughs> so. um, Keith says, thank you for mentioning the Magnificat, because now that kind of helps to, to make sense. And then Jacob had a comment to see the sky. By the way, just before we go there, remember also mm -hmm. in that scene with Elizabeth, Elizabeth is rendered prophetic because of the child and the spirit that have filled her, she says, how is it that the mother of my Lord has come to me? How did she know? How did she know that this child in Mary's belly is her Lord? So again, Elizabeth is prophetic. Zachariah is prophetic because we know that we sing also in the morning the great song of Zachariah, the Benedictus. If you go back to the song in the New Testament, you will see that it doesn't say, and Zechariah opened his mouth and said. It doesn't say Zechariah sang. It says Zechariah prophesied. Uh, and so again, we see how these characters in the first two chapters are really prophetic figures filled with the spirit. And it's the spirit that we ask to be filled with so that we can make place for the child that is coming as they do in that spirit of prophecy. Um, Jacob's comment was uh, to see the sky. And I'm assuming yes. he's referring to our discussion about standing erect. Standing with your head held high, okay? Yeah. To see the sky, absolutely. Huh? And again, that's, that's the attitude of praise and dance. Um. Yolandi's raised her hand. Yolandi, is it possible for you to put your question in the chat for us, rather? There's too many people on the call to just be shaking your head. <laughs> Can I take her question, David? Yes, absolutely. Yolanda, you're right next to me on my screen. You're my name. Uh, let me just see if I can get you to unmute. Ah, I see. We have a technical problem with muting. There we are. Yolanda, you can speak. You can speak. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm a bit of a dinosaur and I haven't been able to work out how you do the chat. Um, Father David, well, thank you incredibly much. There's just a question that I was wondering about. The translation of the word, which in the Hebrew um, would have had a young woman, mm -hmm. but in the Greek, when it was translated in the Septuagint, has virgin. Right. And that shift, if it had stayed young woman, would we be able to draw out the same things to Mary? So, of course, this is a very complicated and very delicate question, but let's just at least technically lay out the issue. 
When we look in Hebrew, we see the word Alma. Alma is young woman. When we look in Greek, and it would be Greek that would be the basis of the New Testament, we see yes. the word Parthenos. Okay. What I'm adding, which is not an explanation, but it is an interesting context, is that the word Parthenos, virgin, in Hebrew, Bitula, appears repeatedly in prophetic literature to describe the people, the people of Israel. Okay. okay. And that might have influenced uh, the translator. But, Yolanda, we know also that this unfortunately led to centuries of polemic between Jews and Christians. Jews saying to Christians, ah, it's not even written virgin, and there you've got a virgin. Huh? There is a very polemical, but I'm going to tell it anyway, because it's quite a beautiful Christian midrash. Some of you might have heard this mm -hmm. from me before. It's the midrash of what happened when the Septuagint was translated. In other words, when the Hebrew was translated into Greek. And it goes like this. So the 70 elders were in their cells translating, and one of the 70 was a man we know in the, Old in the New Testament. In these very chapters, he's described as being very old. He's Simeon, who will welcome Jesus into the temple. Now the Midrash claims he was one of the 70. It's not historical. It's a narrative story for exegetical purposes. And Simeon is in his cell, and he's reached Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. He's about to translate it, and he sees the words, Hinei alma hara, and he translates it very literally in his head. Uh, here is the young woman, young woman, neaniske, one of the words for one woman. He was going to write neaniske. What happens? An angel comes and stops his hand <laughs> and says, Simeon, do not write neaniske. Write Parthenos, and you will live to see the fulfillment of the prophecy. Again, this is a midrash born in the polemic between Jews and Christians, but I think it does help us uh, in one sense, and that is the Bible can be translated in many different ways. Okay, and so I don't think we should get too hung up uh, on that that difficulty of Alma being translated as Parthenos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Ursula, that... we're about to go into load shedding. Yes, so I was going to, to wrap it up. Um, the M. Henning says a lovely discussion at the end. Thank you very much. I just want to read because I'm seeing Rudy Khalil, who is joining us from Beirut, I might add. Oh, has welcome. something very interesting that I'm going to think about, and that is head held high also seems to give us an image of the crucified one on the cross. Okay, and I think that that's a very powerful image. We're going to come back to that link between the nativity and the crucifixion, not next week, but the week after, when we will continue as part of the theme being Mary the prophetess. So next week, we will be looking at Nazareth and Bethlehem, the two places, and what do they mean other than being geographical places in Palestine at the time. So thank you very, very much for being with us, and I hope to see everyone again next week. Ursula, sorry, you wanted to add something, maybe? No, I just wanted to say thank you very much, David, and good night, everybody.